Five years ago, Microsoft released one of the best games for the Xbox One. For once, they put their faith in an exclusive game that didn't have the words Halo, Forza, or Gears in the title, and it actually paid off well for them. Ori and the Blind Forest was highly acclaimed upon release, became profitable very quickly, and later Microsoft approved a Nintendo Switch port alongside the equally praised Cuphead. As someone who absolutely loves Metroidvanias, I knew that I eventually had to give it a shot. The release of said Switch version and the brand new sequel Ori and the Will of the Wisps were what convinced me to finally take the plunge. And now that I've played both games, I wish to ask you all a question. Have you ever played a video game that caused you to... feel something? And no, I'm not referring to the most overused and memeable phrase in gaming journalism. Rather, an experience that rivals the emotional power of something you might expect from Studio Ghibli, or any other noteworthy animation studio that actually puts effort into what they do. When such people get together to work on a project, more often than not, they come up with something very special. This is exactly how you describe the Ori games. Art that relies heavily on its pathos to carry you through, and oh boy, do these games ever. As a disclaimer, this video will be geared more towards discussing the new game Ori and the Will of the Wisps, but I will touch on aspects of the original game to address my points on the sequel. With that, let's jump right into these absolutely beautiful, although flawed, video games. In both games, things start out in peaceful, quiet serenity, as we see the characters enjoying their humble existence together. But then some inciting incident occurs that thrusts the player character Ori, a forest spirit, and their companions into a dangerous scenario. In both cases, you have to repel a catastrophic threat to nature, and a very video game appropriate task is then laid before Ori, the likes of which requires the player to visit locations across the in-game world and restore the natural order of things. Maneuvering around said worlds is one of the series' biggest draws. Given that as you continually progress and gain new abilities, Ori becomes extremely agile. The original game had this problem of certain platforms requiring annoyingly precise jumps, but this isn't an issue for long since the games are designed to constantly reward the player. Obtaining useful abilities and upgrades to your health and power racks up quickly if you actively explore as you fulfill the main objectives, which made me happy since I normally feel compelled to find every seeker possible in a game. It helps that the new game is a considerably denser, more ambitious world that's packed with secrets, even though this resulted in some aggravating backtracking in the latter portions of the game. But in either case, getting 100% completion is actually really fun and seamless to get due to the well-designed map, so it typically works hand-in-hand -hand with the core gameplay. As you steadily progress and diversify your skill set in either game, it becomes more fluid and entertaining to zip around the environment. The speed at which you can dash, launch, and swing yourself around infuses energy into the game that makes it very difficult to put down. And keeping in the spirit of classic Metroidvanias, there is almost always something to collect, explore, and fight in either game, keeping the pacing consistently strong throughout. With all of these elements combined, along with an intuitive control scheme, there is never a dull moment to be found here. Will of the Wisps does have some distinctive gameplay features that make it stand out from its predecessor, though. Whereas the original felt like its own unique thing, the sequel builds upon that foundation by taking the same type of level design and movement, and then incorporating mechanics from one of its contemporaries, Hollow Knight. Moon Studios wasn't shy about showing how it borrowed these elements and made them their own either. As opposed to the original game's bland combat system of endless button mashing, they implemented a directional sword-based combat mechanic that actually adds much more freedom to how you fight enemies. Weapons and abilities can also be assigned to hotkeys. Some of my favorites included the bow, hammer, and the powerful spike that is more or less a laser javelin. These added mechanics are counterbalanced with tough enemies that tend to attack in groups, especially in special challenges called combat shrines like you see here, that reward you with XP and upgrades upon completion. Sometimes the chaotic nature of these encounters is a bit much to comprehend at once, but I really appreciated the challenge, and Ori's very fluid movement certainly helped me stay on top of things. The only addition to the combat that I don't really care for is that despite how fun it is to dash through water and sand, attacking creatures with the dash itself is very cumbersome. An enemy takes at least 3-4 to four hits with the dash to die, so I found myself twisting Ori around in frantic circles just so I could take them out. It often resulted in quickly reduced health between getting hit by enemies or accidentally dashing into environmental hazards. This mechanic was also implemented clumsily into some boss battles, which by the way, the sequel has boss battles! Whereas the original just had elaborately staged escape sequences, which are very exciting challenges in their own right, the sequel features both. Hollow Knight and other Metroidvanias were certainly influences in that regard, but rightly so, for the gameplay variety was helped by this welcome change. Admittedly, some of these bosses could have benefited from some difficulty balancing and tweaks to how much damage they could soak up, but I had fun with them regardless, especially the final one. But hold on, I ain't done comparing this to Hollow Knight. 
Another key change is how upgrades work. In the original, upgrading Ori was done by gathering a substance called Spirit Light, which then contributed to getting points meant for a fairly standard skill tree. This has been completely overhauled in the new game, but in my opinion, for the better. You still collect Spirit Light, but this time, it acts as a currency useful towards goods and services offered by merchants. It's meant for upgrading combat skills, of course, but it can also contribute towards getting Spirit Shards, perks that are very much in the same vein as Hollow Knight's charms. These can be upgraded with Spirit Light, and other shards can be found in secret areas in the world, but their implementation and usefulness is arguably more streamlined than the game that originated the concept. Find as many of these as you can and beat all of the combat shrines. You'll thank me later, I promise. And the last direct influence from Hollow Knight is how you expand the game world map. For instead of finding map stones like in the original game, you frequently encounter a quirky cartographer who recruits your help in charting the overall map, much like Cornifer. Seriously, at the rate I was going, I thought I would encounter someone who said, Ah, <sighs> But again, I don't mean to say all these things as negatives. Sure, Ori and the Will of the Wisps is more derivative of its competition than the game that came before, yet all for a wise and effective purpose. That original game, Ori and the Blind Forest, already had a solid foundation as a mysterious, secret-laden platforming adventure with some Metroidvania elements tacked on. The sequel just examined what worked, refined them or removed them entirely, and then the development team made wise decisions about what new material to include. At the end of the day, what we got is a product that veers closer to being a full-fledged action-adventure game. It does so by taking the solid Ori platforming and successfully adding in fluid combat, more incentives to explore, side quests to complete, and designing a more rewarding progression system. Even though these things do improve the game significantly from its predecessor, there are also a number of things it does that are surprisingly worse, and it's primarily the game's performance that I take issue with. The original wasn't perfect, but even when running on a Nintendo Switch, the frame rate almost always ran at a buttery smooth 60 frames per second, on top of a consistently high resolution in docked or handheld mode. From what I could tell, Ori and the Will of the Wisps ran on the same engine, but it had a far tougher time maintaining its frame rate, load times, and overall performance. I frequently encountered flat-out screen freezes as my Xbox One would try to load new areas or combat scenarios. These only got more severe and frequent as I progressed in the game, for the more I unlocked areas of the map, things increasingly got slower and more disruptive of the gameplay. It might seem like a small issue to harp on, but for a game that was heavily marketed as something that would take advantage of the Xbox One's 4K HDR capabilities, the graphical performance is both disappointing and irritating. These freezes, along with pop-ins and late texture loads, just took me out of the experience whenever they happened. And I think this is crucial, for both games nonetheless feature stunningly beautiful worlds, teeming with life, personality, and creativity. Almost everything you see in these games is a hand drawn digital creation, and impressively, they all are seamlessly integrated with each other. It's not often that the level design feels as though it was specifically engineered to function in a video game. The worlds presented to the player come across as genuinely interesting environments that just happen to make sense in the context of the game. Indeed, they're closer to being tactile places than levels on a platformer, and given that these areas are bursting with vibrant colors and unique design elements, they're all very easy to look at. But sadly, the graphics aren't the only thing that took a dip in quality from the first, for I also felt that the storytelling wasn't as good here. Not that the original was some grand masterpiece, but accomplished a lot through no dialogue. Only the occasional text supplemented what was mostly told through music, visual storytelling, and character animations. Beyond that, the story actually had something to say that echoed Hayao Miyazaki's views on environmentalism, which were legitimate influences, but also about what happens when violence is bred from misunderstanding and blind hatred. With the new game, it mostly felt like the developers just repeated a lot of the things that came before. It only makes sense why Moon Studios would stick to what already worked, but it made the story somewhat stale due to how much they seemed to repurpose specific elements of the first game, namely the villain, core plot, and even how and when certain beats would occur in the narrative. Neither does it help that the very end of the game requires the player to really believe a bold decision that the main character makes, and I just wasn't convinced. Yet with all that being said, I don't want these issues to diminish how I feel about either of these very worthwhile games. Ori and the Will of the Wisps may be better with realizing its ambitious ideas and gameplay mechanics instead of the overall cohesion and fine-tuned storytelling of the original, but both games are substantial achievements in their own ways, and one thing I could definitely say is a constant between the Ori series is the music. 
I'm not even going to attempt doing justice to Gareth Coker's outstanding work, but just put the playlist for either game on for background music while you're stuck working at home. You will not regret it. Some people are playing Animal Crossing's New Horizons to escape from the turmoil we're all experiencing right now, but may I humbly suggest the Ori games for that instead? You'll get a challenge, yes, but you will also be treated to relaxing, immersive, and emotionally resonant experiences that will bring you joy no matter your circumstances. Thank you